unpacking our toolbox. And it was interesting that he said unpacking it because to unpack something means you already have it. You're in possession of it. And so it's the things that It's the things that are in our toolbox, the things that we already have in our possession that he wants us to realize because we're coming into a season where we're going to need to access things that we've already been given. And he wants us to recognize that we already have these things. So last week we talked about um, our thoughts and so that we have dominion over our thoughts and it was strange to me that that would be the first tool that God wanted us to talk about but everything starts in our mind and so in that way it's not because if we control our thoughts if we control our tongue if we can bridle that then that's most of your battle because the war is in our minds. And I have the same thing. I have issues. I get discouraged when I see things look different than, I, than what I'm believing for. And when I say what I'm believing for, I would listen to the voice of God. If he tells me to do something, I'll do what he tells me to do. And because of that, he has shown me some different things, and I know that I know that I know what that looks like. And it doesn't look like today in the natural. It's wonderful. And so it's interesting that when you have to go through something, that God will reach out and give you a word, and he'll encourage you, and he gives you something to hold on to. But what you're holding on to may look different than what you're believing for. It may look different than what your day does when you wake up. You may not be there yet, but we can't let that discourage us. So this morning, I want us to realize how do we get out of that place when things look differently? How do we go boldly and courageously forward? That's what he told me for today. Boldness and courage is already in your toolbox. Boldness and courage. You found yours. Boldness and courage is already in our toolbox. So for each person, it's going to look different, but God will give you something. I recently had a guy reach out to me, and he lives in another country, and he said, I hear this for you from the Lord. And the very end of it, I won't go through the whole thing, but the very end of it was something's going to transpire and the people are coming. He had no idea what he was saying to me. I knew what he was saying. He didn't have a clue because he didn't see in the natural. He's not here. He doesn't know. And it's words like these that God wants to encourage you, but when he does, we have to grab hold of that promise and we have to stand on it and we have to look at anything that does not look like that and tell it, you're lying, move. God came to give us life and life more abundantly. So in 1 Corinthians 3.16, this is not in my scriptures, but it says, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So what does that mean? It means you have everything in you that you need. You are the temple of God. Come on now. And the Spirit of God lives and dwells Inside of you, you have everything that you need. So it doesn't feel like it, and you've, you're worried, and, and you're concerned about tests. You're concerned about 
finances, you're concerned about things meeting certain criteria, you're concerned about health. We get all these things that get between us and what we're going for. And it says, you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So understand while I'm speaking to you, even now, that there is a life force, the very DNA of God, that's being awakened and is listening to the living Word of God being spoken right now, and it's going deep and doing a work, and it's bringing change in your life, in your thinking, in your processing, and in your situations, even now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So unpacking Let me just a minute. I just had a glitch. There we go. Unpacking our toolbox, part 2, courage and bravery. Courage and bravery. First, watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave and be strong. So before we move on, it says watch for it. We know the story of the prodigal son. We know that the prodigal son, that while he was gone, that his father kept, about what he needed to do, but he kept going to the high place in the house and he kept looking out the window and he could see a great distance because he was up high and he kept looking out the window and as he looked out the window, he would watch for the promise to come to him because his faith was that he knew God was his God. He knew God was his Savior. He knew what had been done for him. And he prayed and cried out and he believed. And even though he did not see something so many times that he climbed the steps and went to the high place in his house, he still watched for it. He watched and he watched and he watched. He did not get tired and say, no, well, he's not coming. It's been a long time that we've been waiting for the thing that God said is going to happen, the thing I'm believing for, the promise that I cried out to God for. It's been a long time, so I'm not going to watch anymore. He didn't do that. He continued because he knew what he had seen. So we have to watch for the promises. Watch for the declarations that have been spoken into your life. Watch for the things you're believing God for. And you have to find that inside of you because the very DNA of God is in you. And so you wake up that thing that's sleeping that you need to be listening to and encourage that rightful voice and go forth and watch. It says, be brave and be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Guys, this is a battle for some people. Once you get it, you get it. But getting there can be hard, and you're still going to be tested. But it is hard when someone is not treating you with love to give love to them anyway. You don't give love when, only to people who love you back. You don't give love when it's deserved. It says in all that you do, let it be done with love. 1 Chronicles 28 and 20. And David said to Solomon, his son, this really ministered to me earlier in the week, be strong and of good courage, and do it. Do what? Do what he's told you to do. Quit waiting. Quit being lazy. Do the thing that God speaks to you to do. 
And what really ministered to me here is that so often we just want to sit down and say, well, I wish things were different. I wish y'all did this and did this and did this. Y'all aren't entertaining me. I want to go somewhere where I feel this and this is in place. What are you doing? We want to sit down. It doesn't say that. It says be strong and of good courage and do it. We have to get up and be the people that we're wanting other people to be for us. We have to become the thing that we're needing. We have to become that for other people. Do you know when you're faithful and you are doing that God will supply all of your needs? When we're walking in obedience, we can't miss it. He's a good God, a good Father. It says, fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. We've got to quit sitting. It's so comfortable and we think that we're happier sitting. You don't know how fulfilling it is and how good it is to minister to someone else. And if you're sitting, you're missing out on that. There is something that brings peace. You, you talk about wanting peace in a relationship with other people, whether it be a spouse, whether it be um, family members, whatever it is. But when you're pursuing Operating in love. You're pursuing being loving. You're pursuing doing the things that you need to be doing. When you're doing those things, then you're going to attract that back to you. It may take a while because each person's doing their own walk. But you're going to get it. If a person won't give it to you, God will. He's that kind of faithful. And you can't tell me he won't because it's been done for me many times. I tell everybody that I'm his favorite, but in reality I know that we should all feel that way. But I do, I'll tell people all the time, I say I'm his favorite. Hallelujah. John 14, 26. I just want y'all to visualize while we're talking your toolboxes. Visualize the toolboxes and everything inside of them that you need being pulled out and used as you need it. And that some of them have dust. Just see yourself polishing and cleaning and all in those things because they need to be current and ready. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. And we say that because... We know that Jesus, when he went to be with the Father, he says, I'm sending you the Comforter. I'm sending you another. And he will be sent in my name, and he's going to teach you all things. Jesus would minister to large groups and small groups when he was here, and that's what's recorded for us. But the Holy Spirit is where God is inside of us. We're inside of him. The Holy Spirit can minister to you and will minister to you in every moment that you get still and just focus. And you're like, okay, what do I need to be doing right now? And he'll tell you. What do I need? How do I need to deal with this situation? He'll reveal it to you. But you've got to quieten everything down. Like we talked about last week, 
and let his voice be louder. Hallelujah. So it said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world gives things in a way where you, they may walk up to you and tell you how much they love you, and then they're gone, and you're like, wait a minute, I thought you loved me. And it, it doesn't last like that because there's different motivations. God is not like that. And he gives you something, it's yours. And if he makes covenant with you, he keeps his side of the covenant. Even when we break ours, when he makes covenant with you, he keeps it. So it said, don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. What are we talking about today? Boldness and courage. So part of our boldness and our courage is in realizing that what he gave us, he's not taking it back. There's nothing you can do that will cause him to reject you where he would want to take back from you the good thing that he gave you. There's nothing you can do that will cause him to say, I don't love you anymore, or I want a divorce from you, or I want to be with someone else. There is nothing you can do that will stop his love. He pursues your relationship. He pursues your love. And he loves you even when you're unlovable. So that tool stays in your toolbox. It's not going anywhere. He's not taking it back. He loves you. Psalms 27 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's not you. He is the light of your salvation. He is your strength in your life. So you can go bold. You can be courageous. Psalms 56, verse 3 and 4 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust. In you. In God, I will praise his word. And this is a season, Miss Rosalind was talk about this, talking about this this morning, that she just feels so drawn to just worship. Not the loud and let's entertain us and let's be fun, which is it's good. It's all good. There's a time to be dancing. But there's a time for worship and a time where you say, God, I praise you because everything you've said is coming. Everything you've already done for me, I'm walking in it. And it said, in God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do. 1 Timothy 1 and 3. And I have to tell y'all that I got here accidentally. I was looking for another verse and typed in the wrong thing. And it really ministered to me. I'll see if I can get y'all as excited about it as I did. 1 Timothy 1 3 says, As I besought, what is that? I pursued. I pursued you. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. What is this saying in English? In English, he said, I'm charging you or I'm petitioning you to tell the people not to believe other doctrines. Tell the people don't get caught up in stuff that is not necessary. And so verse 4 says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. And I want to tell you, how much talk do we hear about now 
in the, we talk about the rabbit hole and the deep dive of the rabbit hole. And so this really ministered, I felt like today, I didn't even realize this scripture was in there because back when this was written, the Jewish scholars said they believed that this had to do with talking about fallen angels and how they had multiplied in the earth and who may be descendants of that. And we know like the gods, Greek gods, little g, that we have in our history were probably actually real. And they would have been descendants from fallen angels. And so they would have walked in some of their authority that they had when they were kicked out of heaven. And we know that the study of the stars and all that, we, we learned and were taught things through those sources. Well, even knowing that, it said going and studying the genealogy that we put all this effort in and we think about all these things and we're talking and thinking about, well, what does this mean? And we want to spend so much time looking at things to see how we got to where we are now. And it's going to be as it is in the days of Noah is what it's going to be in the end times, which were there. So what does this mean? And God's saying in the scripture here, don't give heed to it. So don't worry. Don't spend time thinking, well, what does this change? Because it doesn't change anything. The book was written so many years ago, and it was all the way through the end of Revelation. So what happens in between, we can't get so discouraged with stuff that we take heed to that. And we're doing this, even though we're, we're learning, we're looking, we're digging, but we're still sitting, we're not doing. And so some of the time that we're spent in our research, some of the time that we're spending worrying, some of the time that we get consumed and we're holding our phone and get locked in on TikTok, some of the time that we're doing that, God's saying, go do the thing, go do something. Have an active prayer life, pursue him and bring revelation so that you are actually changing and affecting the environment around you rather than just trying to see what's going on and reading it. You're not accomplishing anything in the time of reading and trying to see what happened from here to here if you're not actually having an active prayer life and you're not actually seeking and pulling those things from Father. So it said not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. So what does that mean? It ministers questions. It means that they're going to leave you with more questions after you study or after you read yeah. than you had. Yeah. It's going to make you wonder about more things and not answer any questions, but the questions that it may feel like it's answering is going to open up a lot more questions. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you that there is a place you can get in kingdom, there's a place you can get with God where you're praying and you're so prayerful and your mind is so on him that if he needs you to accomplish a thing, he'll take you to do it. Hallelujah. It said it would minister more questions to you rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. And then it says, so do. There it is again. So do. We're wanting what? Courage and boldness because it is an effective tool of the kingdom. It's an effective tool in your life that will change everything. It'll change your outlook. There's times where you're going to be afraid to do a thing, but you do stuff out of obedience to the Lord. And because you're being obedient, he covers you. He goes with you through the middle of all of it. 
Verse 5 says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of good conscience and of faith unfeigned. What is that telling us? That faith is unhindered. Faith is unhindered. And the commandment of charity is out of a pure heart, out of a good conscience. And verse 6 says, Which some having swerved have turned aside into vain gangling. But listen to this. So what is it talking about swerving and missing something? Like you're trying to go from here to here, but you're doing this. Because the scriptures that were right before this, taking everything in context, it's telling us when we're pursuing how to answer these questions and we're digging and we're going down the rabbit hole, that we're doing that and that's where our focus is. And so because we're do putting our focus there and we're not doing what we need to be doing, that we're detoured. We went around, we've swerved. God's good and he's, this is merciful. This is merciful. He's reminding us. He's reminding us, trust me. Trust me. You don't have to look at this and this and this because when something happens, if something happens, I'm going to tell you what you need to do in that moment. And if I need you to have something, I'll tell you to have it. If I need you to do something, I will tell you to do it. We have to trust the voice of the Lord more so than operating in fear so that we pull ourselves up and we're focused and we are operating out of faith. We're operating in a knowing that God has us in the palm of his hands and we don't have to pursue something that would operate in fear in our life. Verse 7 says, Sometimes even desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor what they affirm. So what does that mean? It's talking about that when we're swerving, we have so much knowledge and we can teach on different subjects. And there's a lot of supernatural stuff that I can teach about, but I don't put all of my time and all of my words on that because it's best that I am recalling what he's telling me now and recalling what I'm walking in now and recalling like and being sensitive and obedient so that if he gives me a word for another that I can listen and hear and I can give that living word to another person. But having the theologies does not accomplish everything that you need to accomplish because theology without relationship is just going to be a lot of swerving. Mm. A lot of swerving from what we just read. It's not doing what he wants done. It's giving you a lot of knowledge. But if you aren't pursuing relationship, it's just a lot of swerving. Verse 7. For God has not given... This is Second Timothy, and this is actually what I was looking for when he brought me the other. And it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear... Y'all know this, but of power and love and a sound mind. So here we are in the holidays. We've got different people that get together. It may be some of the ones you don't associate with as often. And you may have other encounters or you may just be dealing with a tougher situation. Maybe you're isolated this year. So it said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. There's our boldness. There's our courage. He's given us power and love. We read that earlier. Do these things in love and of a sound mind. If we stay out of the rabbit holes and we're not swerving, we're going to have clearer thinking. If someone has felt rejected, 
Can you imagine what it would be like to pick up like the letters or the things that were the rejection, the words of rejection, read them over and over and over? How, what kind of fruit will that produce in your life? And so we're not going to do that. We want the living word of God and we want the truth and faith. And we want to go over that and over that and over that so that it destroys the work of the enemy. It destroys anything that looks like fear. It destroys anything that does not have a productive work of life in our life. Hallelujah. Isaiah 41, if you want to look it up. Verse 10, it says, fear not for I am with you. I know this is a lot of scriptures, but because of the teaching, because of the toolbox, I want to pour it all on you in each section. And there's so much more. It's so much bigger and deeper and it could go on and on. But I want you to feel full in your toolbox. I want you to need a bigger toolbox each week. That's what I want. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Verse 11. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. We're not striving against God. We're just wanting Him to see us, and we do that when we are being obedient. When we are praying, we realize, God, you didn't go anywhere. It was me. Verse 12 says, You shall seek them and not find them, those who contended with you. That means work against. The people who are not on your side, the people who decided and made deliberate choices that they don't want to support you as a person. Those who war against you shall be as nothing and as a non-existent thing. That's just saying we have to be willing to move on. Move on. You don't continue to make that a part of who you are because rejection is not something that we want in our mind. It's not something you want in your spirit. It's not something that looks like God. Verse 13, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Guys, this is good stuff. If that is in your toolbox, and it is, that verse is in your toolbox, that verse is part of you, and you look over in that toolbox when you've got something and you need something because you don't feel strong enough or you don't feel like you're ready to carry through whatever that day holds. And it says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He's with you. If you go through the fire, he's in the furnace with you in the fire. You don't go through something that allows you to become a victim. If you're suffering, he's with you while you're suffering. He suffered for us. He understands it. But says, fear not, I will help you. And 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says, Casting down imaginations, we did this last week, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, that's our thoughts. Well, why are we talking about that? Because if we bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ, then we can walk in everything that he's told us to. So we want to keep that in place. We want to keep that thing 
hushed. We don't even want to allow fear a place. Don't put something in your toolbox that's not helpful for you. Don't put something in your toolbox that doesn't speak to your future and to your destiny. If you have something that you are entertaining in your thoughts or that works against boldness and courage, then get rid of that thing. You look through that toolbox and but nope, you do not belong in here. You got to go. You got to go. Take that thing by the spirit and put it by the front door and kick it. Let it go. So don't come back. Don't come back. Joshua 1 and 2, and we're, we're getting there. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go to Jordan. Hallelujah. Verse 3 says, Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. We're supposed to be flexible, yes. It's not talking about that. It's talking about when God tells you what you need to be doing. Rather than getting discouraged when you mess up, be steadfast and immovable. Don't let discouragement move you off the track and off of the race that you're running. Don't let it reposition you because something's not going your way. If we have a bad day, and we all have bad days, if you have a day where it's not as good as you wanted it to be, be steadfast and unmovable. Brethren, it says, keep this. Because always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because we're being watched. Not just that, because we're setting the atmosphere. We talked about last week being the thermostat, not the thermometer. A thermometer in a room, if the temperature of that room changes, that thermometer changes to read whatever the, the room is reading. But if the thermostat changes, everybody in that room will be affected by what that thermostat changed to. And that's us. That's who we're to be as Christians, is we should affect everyone around us. And it's saying, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. It is called labor. It is not called fun. It is called labor. Why is it called that? Because it's going to take a little bit of effort on your part to do it. It's going to take work on your part to act differently than you feel like acting. It's going to take work on your part to make it look like you're having a good day when you're not. It's, why do I say that? Even in fasting, God said, don't go around looking like you're starving and looking like you're pitiful. He says, you wash your face and you put on your clothes and you look happy and you don't look like you're suffering. God does not get in the boat with victimization. He does not want us to become victims. He wants us to be victorious and we have to pull on our pants just like everybody else and it's not going to be an overnight thing where we have the walk that we want every day but you know what you can make a decision and your walk today can be better than it was yesterday and even if you mess up and you can make another decision tomorrow and tomorrow you can do even better and before you know it when somebody acts like a total I'm trying to think of a Christian word to put in there when they act horrible and they are pushing every button you have that you don't have to be affected, but you affect. And do you know half of it, if you smile and walk away or just don't react, just don't react, just stay calm, stay at peace, don't react. Do you know that takes all the fun out of anything demonic that needs that fight. 
it didn't get satisfied. And you give it enough time of not being satisfied and even their burden and their compromise to have that as part of their life and to make that an active part of their life will get smaller or they'll go somewhere else where they can find it. But if they are not feeding something, it will starve and it'll go away. And you can help people not feed it just by not reacting. But for as much as you know that the labor is not in vain in the Lord. In Deuteronomy 31, starting at verse 6, what are we talking about today? Boldness and courage. We take hold of our thoughts, but we're holding them. And now we need boldness and courage. And we have it. We've got to walk in it. So it says, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. What does that mean? He will not let you down. He will not let you down. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto the fathers to give them, and you cause them to inherit it. So we have to go and do. We have to go and do. We've heard that three times already today. Go and do. What God has told you is yours, is yours. What God has said and what he says something looks like is what it looks like. So we have to walk in that. Start visualizing it. Start seeing it. Put your faith there. And it says, and it will cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is that. He goes before you. And he will be with you, and he will not fail you, neither forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Said, don't even be shaken. Don't even be shaken. Don't even be swayed. Talking about the swerving. Don't even swerve. Don't even swerve. Don't be dismayed. It says that God will go with you. God will not fail you. So when God's given a promise, now get a hold of this, this is big. Tina, why are you doing what you're doing? Because when God gives a promise, he won't break his promise. When God said he's going to do a thing, he's going to do a thing. And as long as he has said something and he's going to do a thing, then we have to be obedient. We don't want to swerve because of how something feels or how something looks or how something smells, how something tastes. We have to be fervent in following him. Psalms 23, starting at verse 1. And we all know this. I think this is one of Michael's favorite scriptures. And it's all good. We're just stopping at verse 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It's not a dead work. It's a living work. It's a living work. It's a living word. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I heard this word somewhere today. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through. We, we like it up to that point. It's like, wait a minute. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Yeah. Yeah. Let me stay by these waters. <laughs> Let me stay by this green grass. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't do it, nope. That's something that a lot of people leave their walk with the Lord because when they go through something difficult, they stopped there and they built a house in that place and that brought destruction to them because they were supposed to go through a thing and they never went back up on another mountaintop. They stayed there. They were so distraught. And God doesn't want us to do that. Because if we realize he's with us, he goes with us. He's always with us. Come on. But it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this morning, I don't know what people are going through. I didn't even know who would be here or who would be listening online this morning when this was being prepared. But God does. And this word for bravery and for courage is something that we needed. So if y'all would please stand. Hallelujah. Let's do a corporate prayer this morning. Because sometimes we let other stuff get in the way or sometimes we've been digging down rabbit holes and we've swerved. And this morning we want to get our, our walk straight, our focus straight. Hallelujah. And guys, when I say the things about not looking at things we shouldn't be looking at. I'm going to say one more thing. If you're listening online, please hear this. There is purposely put out works of division. They want us to fight with each other. They want us to think that there was two sides Politically, there's not. They want us to have an idea because if you can have two sides to something, then it can be this one against that one. I think they even enjoy uh, the competition in football, and we know how ugly. You can see some people that take that so serious that even within our state, we're in Alabama, that... This one can't stand this one if they support the other team. I'm, I'm being serious. I know some of y'all are going, that's not real. It is. It's very real. And it is a work of division. If someone tells you that your value is different because you are white or your value is different because you are black or your value is different because your skin is any color, whatever, there's so many variations of color. If anyone tells you you're different because of that, you believe the lie. And the lie has been fed so big that people actually treat people different because they believed it. That is not the will of God. And I'm going to tell you, if you go back in history, you'll find out that there were different times that this thing would pursue this one against that one or that one against this one. It's not the will of God. The will of God is that we do what we're supposed to do. And if we are unified, God keep this up. If we are unified and realize who we are, we're all children of God. Amen. Amen. The same groups that want the division 
think that there's a handful, and I mean a small handful, of families that have a greater value and they play with our futures and our destinies and make decisions for us in a way that it would be like if you're sitting in the Roman Colosseums and throwing the line out and seeing and people cheering and watching to see what happens to the poor soul that would have to defend themselves with the lion. And it means no more to them. Other lives don't because they feel because of position that they gave themselves that their value is different than another person's value. And it's not true. But if we believe a thing, it makes it your truth. So we've got to be careful that we don't swerve our calling, that we don't swerve our destiny. We need to pursue what thus saith the Lord is in our lives. We need to realize that life is bigger than what we've made it and so much of the things, the way we've looked at it has been a distraction and we need to go forth in boldness and love one another as Christ loves the church. And we have to not only believe a thing, but we have to be, it, it said, go and do. Go and do. I can sit here like I did, and I can believe the right thing all day long, but if I'm not being loving to everyone, if I'm not being that, if I'm not stirring the truth in a matter, then because I'm doing nothing, I'm supporting the lie. So we have to be bold. We have to be courageous because you have that in your toolbox. You have to stand up with the many, many, many voices that disagree with what I just said, that disagree with the Word of God, and that they want the division. They need the division because there's so many agendas that would just be shut down if the division wasn't there. There's so many different things that would change if the division was not there anymore. And they need that. They need that. They need the focus to be different than what it should be. And the church has to rise up. The church has to rise up in truth and start speaking life over everyone and start becoming like Jesus and start reflecting him to other people and stop with all this other stuff. And I understand we, we all operate out of the knowledge that we have. We operate out of what we have been taught. But we need to go back and examine because a lot of us, what we've been taught is, is sinful. It's not right. And if your heart makes you think that you're less than or more than anyone else, you need to repent. You need to repent. Because God loves you and we're all, we should all feel, like I said earlier, I said I'm his favorite. We should all feel that way. Because he loves you. He loves you. And I want you today to be able to go forth and be bold and courageous. So let's pray. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Father God, we love you so much. Mm. We thank you, God, for your many blessings. We thank you for your favor. And Father, I ask that our toolbox be open and be useful to us. I ask you, God, that boldness and courage to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to become who we're supposed to be, and to encourage and give and do for other people 
God, that we would have the boldness and courage and we would activate the use of these tools that they would not be rusty, that they would not be stuck, that they would not still be in their package. God, but that we would utilize these tools for kingdom in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And Father, I ask you that everyone that came out today, I thank you for them, God, and I ask that you cover them and keep them till we come together again in Jesus' name. Amen.